Welcome to the Defense and Aerospace Report. I'm Vagam Radian here at the Association of the United States Army's annual conference and trade show in Washington, D.C., the number one gathering of U.S. Army leaders from around the world. Our coverage here is sponsored by General Motors Defense, Bell, L3 Harris and Leonardo DRS, and it's our honor to be talking to Major General Todd Royer, who is the Commanding General of the Army uh, Aviation and Missile Command down in sunny Huntsville, Alabama. Sir, thanks very much for the time. Oh, thank you. Great to be here. Uh, so let's talk about it. It's a shift to great power competition, but a lot of this stuff does not happen unless the Army Materiel Command, funny enough, is supporting the entire enterprise. Uh, you know, all the leaders are talking about increasingly distributed operations under fire. That means not only do units have to move around, like Dave Francis's units as Army Aviation, uh, the folks that are working for Lieutenant General Cavoli in Europe or General Brown in Asia, that also means that the logistics is going to have to move with them. Talk to us about how you guys, as an enterprise, General Perna and the team are thinking about how this mobile logistics are going to keep up with the pace of operations under fire. Well, first of all, we want to make sure that the, they have what they need when they need it. So if a soldier is out there and they need a part, uh, we want to make sure they have literally 100% supply availability. So consequently, if they need a part, you know, today, we want them to have it today uh, at that time. We've made a lot of strides here recently to make sure that that's happening, and so that's really moving in the right direction. But really, that's not enough. Uh, so the, really, the fact of the matter is we don't want them to really have to need parts as often as they do. And so a lot of things that we are doing to prepare for multi-domain operations or large-scale uh, combat operations is to help reduce the burden, the maintenance burden, of soldiers in the field. If they don't need parts as often, they don't have to carry as much, uh, we don't have to use as much transportation to get it there, it really is a combined effect. And, and tell us how you're using big data, predictive analytics, and all of these other elements to ensure that you're actually getting the most out of the systems that you already have in inventory. Well, that's a great question. So for most of our aircraft, we actually have sensors on board those aircraft, and then they'll, they'll help us identify, hey, when a particular part may be going bad. And that's great for the individual aircraft. What it really provides us is the broader perspective of what we need to do uh, to help re-engineer, modify uh, the entire fleet. So consequently, we may be able to extend the life of certain components on aircraft, uh, and the more we do that, the less time soldiers have to touch it, the less parts we have to stock in the field, and helps uh, decrease the overall maintenance time. Um, when you look at how are you working uh, on the cross-functional team side, but as well as with the acquisition community, uh, to effectively help engineer more supportable systems in the field. It doesn't matter if you have the best Army attack helicopter and the Apache is a terrific helicopter, but availability has always been a little bit of a challenge to get the airplane up to the, to, to a higher reliability level. If you're looking at, at highly intense uh, situations where you don't have as easy access to logistics, each part with it carries a human burden and a human risk. How are you working with the acquisition community to make sure that future systems are more sustainable even, and we talked to Dr. Jetty about this a little bit as well, that have a little bit more upfront investment to reduce actually the long-term tail of a, of a program? Well, I'm really glad you asked that um, because we do. We work very closely hand-in-hand -hand with uh, Brigadier General Rugen and the Future Vertical Lift uh, cross-functional team. And really what it comes down to is setting the requirements for the sustainment and reliability to a level that is going to help increase performance. The Apache, the Black Hawk, the rest of the Big Five were absolutely monumental you know, to the Army uh, back in the 1970s and 80s. But there's no reason that we shouldn't set the bar higher for our, our new weapon systems, not only as far as reach and lethality is concerned, but we should also do the same thing for sustainment and maintenance. So consequently, when we put out those proposals out there, we want uh, the various vendors to come in with a much more uh, higher reliable, sustainable uh, type of a, you know, weapon system, whether that's the future vertical lift. And um, on the missile side of things, um, talk to us a little bit about you know readiness, availability. You know, right now, um, historically, we have not had as many of the kind of munitions that we would like in many cases. Uh, that's in part because we haven't been in as big of a kind of a shooting match where we were expending a huge number of these munitions. But if you look out there in a lot of these scenarios, you know, the the adversary can always count. So you always want to make sure that you have enough stuff in your inventory when the, when when the, when the guy or the gal on the other side pulls the ledger out, they go. Oh, wow, they've got a little bit more of those than I thought they did. Talk to us about where we are on inventories on stock and how you, you're working with industry to be able to recapitalize some of uh, this very, very important capability that at the end of the day is a very important part of the nation's deterrent. Well, first of all, the Army has made tremendous investments in munitions you know, here over the last several years, and it's really helped uh, increase the number of munitions that are available. Uh, that being said, though, some of our current munitions that are out there uh, do have you know, a shelf life. 
And so consequently, we work with industry pretty closely uh, to go through stockpile reliability. Uh, we take a look at a missile that maybe was supposed to last X number of years. We go take a look at it. We may have to re-engineer something, uh, but then we go uh, really build upon that. And so if we can extend the life of those missiles and be able to use them longer, that's really a benefit to the entire Army. But then past that, for the new missiles, we do the exact same thing as we just talked about for aviation. We want to make sure that the sustainment and reliability are built into the new designs. And uh, one last question. Let me ask you about the cyber danger and the cyber threat. I was talking to an Israeli uh, retired military officer, and he was talking about the cyber challenge. Uh, and full disclosure, Northrop Grumman is uh, our uh, cyber uh, sponsor uh, as well. But talk to us a little bit about um, cyber reliability, because one of the things the Israeli officer told me was, hey, you know what, when you do a missile test, you're not necessarily sure why the missile failed, right? I mean, was it just too old in the canister or was there some other challenge? And that now it's really challenging all of our approaches and thinking at a fundamental level about the cyber security of all of our weapon systems. Talk to us a little bit about it, because some of the stuff in the Army inventory, you know, is not a spring chicken uh, and, and may potentially have vulnerabilities associated with it. Well, first of all, I think, you know, cyber, uh we can't look at it as, uh, hey, we did it and now we're done. It is always a continuous process, right? So we need to go ahead and make sure we update it uh, continuously throughout the entire life cycle of any weapon system. Uh, if we stop doing that, then we create vulnerabilities for ourselves. Obviously, we work very closely with our industry partners to make sure that uh, any gaps or seams that might be there, that uh, we identify and close those off as quick as we can. Sir, thanks very much for joining us. We really appreciate it and uh, look forward to seeing you down in Huntsville next time we're in town. Sounds great. Look forward to it.